Berlin is, uh, I wouldn't say even our new CEO because he's been one and a half years already at the helm, one of the most prominent environmental lawyers in the world, uh, climate change policies and so forth, so we're very fortunate to have have Ken come over and join our team uh, last year and uh, to come to San Francisco and be with us today. So um, the floor is yours and I'm gonna pull up your uh, PowerPoint on the back and just tell me what you want to play. I'm gonna start with the video. Okay. Well, again, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I do also want to thank Wade Ty, Sue Stewart. I mean, you guys do a phenomenal job here. And I do have one question for you. Are your speakers always as good as the ones tonight? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start off by talk, telling my story about how, how I became involved with this. Then I'm, going to show, then I'm going to show a couple of videos, one of which the people in Miami saw, the other of which they have not seen, but it's probably okay to see it again. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about where we are as an organization and about our program, really our program going forward, so I can talk about, about it in a way that's a little bit different than what I said in Miami. Um, and I may say a little bit about the Rose of Paris also, uh, which is a major part of our work. Um, anyway, I became, you know, I've, I've been involved in environmental work my, my entire career. I've worked in a lot of different areas. I care about this from a lot of different angles. I mean, I care about its impact on people. I care about its impact on the environment. But I have a particular uh, a story to tell, which is I'm a, I'm a very serious birder. I've seen over 6,000 species of birds in my life. So I've really traveled all over the world looking at birds. And the interesting thing about it is that this is absolutely the golden age of birding. Even though a lot of birds are becoming rare, we know where they are, for the, we know how to get there for the first time. We really know where they are for the first time. When I was younger in the 1980s, I mean, we knew a third as much as we know now with the internet. You know, you can sort of track everything down. You can go look at almost everything. I don't want to be in the last generation that can do that. And I will be unless we do something about that. And we'll never be forgiven for that, because this is something we're talking about that will have an impact for millions of years, because this is gonna overwhelm everything else we've been doing. All the conservation work I did in one stage of my career, all the conservation work being done by groups out there, will just be overwhelmed by this climate change if we're not careful, and if we don't really deal with it now. So that's the reason I become interested in it. Everybody's got a different story. Uh, the important thing is just have, is, is to tell your story in a way that, that resonates emotionally. And you know, mine is kind of weird. I mean, not many people really understand why you like this kind of thing. But uh, it's still, um, you know, the way I think about it. People should also think about it uh, and tell their story uh, in that way. Um, we are actually probably going to do a little bit more on conservation, and we're going to do a training next year probably in the Northeast on birds, climate change, and conservation. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at a lot of forest free issues now. And we're not really quite sure how we're gonna get involved in all that, but we are gonna get uh, involved, particularly mm -hmm. in, a, in a, some of the countries we're working in, as I'll describe in a minute. Um, one of the things we do, and I know it would start this way, but I thought it'd be a nice break for what we're doing, is we have a very, very good media and social media group and creative group at Climate Reality. We have about 11 people working on it. And we're producing really now very, very first class videos. So I want to show two. One of which uh, is our, the first of which I think, yeah, yeah. The first of which is the open letter. Uh, this one? No, the one before. Okay. Um, we, we've run a campaign this year relating to the, to the negotiations in Paris, a asking people to sign a petition demanding that world leaders take action on climate change. Now, when you think about a petition, Petitions only work in a couple of situations. First of all, they've got to be very su successful. And overall, a lot of, almost every group in the environmental community is doing something. Overall, we should have a lot of petition <coughs> signatures. But petitions also only work if there's follow-up. It doesn't matter if you have the names. What you've got to be able to do is go to your politicians and say, mm -hmm. we demand action. You've got to be very specific what you want. Then you have to go out and say to them, and we're going to be there following up on this. So we've been working very hard to gather names, We'll distribute them to the places where we have branch offices, and we'll try and follow up with all these politicians when we do that. In connection with that campaign, we prepared this video, which we call the Open Letter to World Leaders. And if we can run it, that would be great. Right. Okay. Right. It's not this one, it's the other one. Oh, it's the other one? Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs>
Dear Stephen Harper. Dear President Jay Consuma. Dear Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Dear World Leaders. We all know that the climate crisis is here. We can see it all around us. And you are all affected by it. Or if this is our own, then we would do something about it. In fact, some of us already are. Hey, Tony. Stay here, Jay. See where they're at on Parat. In our businesses. Oh, Stephen, what's up? Now it's your turn. As our leaders. As the ones bestowed with power. The power to represent the people. To represent me and me. And me. And, me. and all three of us. Don't forget me. Please listen. Listen to the land. Listen to the ocean. Listen to the science. This is summer 2015. You will be right here in Paris. At the UN Climate Change Conference. Actually, we have some demands. We demand that you cooperate with the world and our world. We demand that you send a message to pollutants. Stop using fossil fuels. Now is the time. The time for you to act. We need to make long-term commitments. Commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> and then you will. The world will be a better place instantly. I want you to look after my future. Lots riding, what you decide. Thanks for listening. Social media, the whole question is, you've got two questions. First, you've got to produce a great product, then you've got to get people to see it. Sometimes it goes viral, but that's very unusual. So we're trying to figure out and working a lot on the distribution, how we get it out, and how we get people to look at it. Can we show it to people ourselves? Yeah, it's on our website. Okay. So if you go to the website, you can get it there. Um, the second video I'm going to show, we run every year a program called 24 Hours of Reality and 24 Hour Webcast. I don't know, how many people have watched 24 Hours in the past? Well, this, this year it's going to be three, it's going to be eight three-hour segments. We're doing it live in eight different countries around the world, all countries in which we have branch offices, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and this is, uh, it's going to be November 13th and 14th, and this is the promo video for that. It's not every day that you can say you were a part of history that you were there when the world changed for the better, that your voice made a difference. On November 13th and 14th, the world will come together to demand our global leaders act on climate change and set us on the path to a better future. Join us for 24 hours of reality and live Earth. We're on the road to Paris where we'll shine a spotlight on climate solutions from around the globe in preparation for this year's critical UN Climate Conference. Let our leaders know the world is watching. This one is not quite as final. So this is not completely final, so the voice will be a little bit clearer. But uh, again, it's just a promo video for that. The world is watching is sort of the theme of the uh, November 13th and 14th uh, promotion. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, a webcam. <coughs> so it should be very, very good. I hope everybody watches. We're trying to organize a lot of uh, uh, um, watch parties around the world on it. If anybody wants to do a watch party, that would be great. Um, so let me talk a little bit about climate, uh, about climate reality and where we are. And again, I'm going to try and do it in the context of, of, of everybody in this room. And I, you know, I'd like, I love interaction with people because I'm really here to listen to people and see what, you, what you're all up to as much as to tell you about what we're doing. But, We've been expanding pretty rapidly as an organization. We now have about uh, 57 employees in the United States. We've got 10 branch offices in which we're actually paying people to work on around the world uh, in 10 different countries. The reason we've done that is 
that the way these climate negotiations are working out is they're very, very interesting because they're really a bottom-up process. What they're doing is they're asking countries to come in and make a commitment as to how much they're willing to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's, it's not something, that the world's not coming and saying, you've got to do 15%, you've got to do 20%, you've got to do 20%. When I first heard this was sort of going to be voluntary, and I've sort of fought voluntary actions my whole life, believing in regulations, and you can't do things voluntarily. I thought this was a crazy idea. But in fact, when it comes to international negotiations, it's not a crazy <coughs> idea. The enforcement mechanisms are very, very difficult on an international level. It's very hard to get countries to comply. They have to want to do it. We see it as an opportunity when a country comes in and says, we're going to reduce our emissions 20%. The task then is to go in and make sure they're binding legal requirements for the country to get to that 20%. So that's what we're going to be doing. We'll be doing campaigns around the world mm -hmm. to do that. And, and the, way, uh, the way Paris is going to work out, we're only going to get part of where we need to be uh, on greenhouse gas emission reductions. Our estimate is going to be that we're going to get about 30 to 40 percent of the emission reductions we need to keep greenhouse gas, to keep the temperature below 2 degrees centigrade. And 2 degrees is probably way too high to begin with. But to do it, even to get there, we're only going to be 30, 40 percent of the way. That's okay if, in fact, we have a review process that gets countries to review their commitments. commitments. And what we've been spending most of our time on is working on a five-year review requirement, where every five years countries have to come in and review their commitments. And what we think is really happening around the world is, is that we're building towards the critical mass we need to get the kind of commitments to really change our whole energy system. We're talking about completely replacing mm -hmm. an a gigantic energy system around the world. We're talking about a trillion dollars a year in investment for 30 or 40 years to do this. So we're getting to the point where we think that can happen. We're not quite there yet. To get there, we need two things. One, public opinion's got to get there. And we're doing a lot better on public opinion than people think, because the polls show that about 70% of all people think that there's a need for climate action. What we've looked at this is the problem we see is not so much of deniers, and we should worry about deniers, we should work on deniers, but in reality, ask yourself a question. 70% of people want action, why don't you get it? I'm sorry, repeat that? 70% of people want action and you can't get it from Congress. I mean, you have a party that won't vote at all on it. And, but in general, and even you've got a lot of Democrats who play the issue. And we think the reason is really very clear and very simple. And that reason is that very few people have made climate change their highest priority issue. And I'll talk a bit about our programs, but all our programs are designed to get people out to become climate voters, to, become, to tell their representatives they want action on climate, to get them to do things about that. And you know, when you look at something like that, if you want action in Congress, you don't need 50% of the people. If you have 5% of people who care about an issue, that's a major political difference in any, in any election. So then, then, you know, 5% of the electorate is, you know, 6 million people. So <coughs> it's a big number, but, it, but it's a doable number. And <coughs> we have to get there. If we don't get there, because we think the number's probably 1% now, then you're dealing with all the money on the other side, all the influence. And it's very, it, I think it actually should be embarrassing to all of us in a sense the opponents of this have been more active and more successful politically than we have. And we just can't allow that to continue. And that's one of the things we'll be working on um, as we go forward. So as an organization, um, if you could put, put my slides on now, are they on? Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to jump through most of this. So we're making pretty good progress. Again, if you're in Miami, you saw this. We now have about 9,400 uh, trained leaders in 126 countries. And last year they made, actually they made over 2,900 presentations. So people are out speaking. Now, what do we do with 9,400 trained leaders, including everybody in this room? And of course that's some ways my greatest challenge in the job, to try and figure out what we can do and how we can work with everybody and how we can make your job easier and, be, and, you know, and get something productive out of all of you. The way we've been organized in climate reality is, the original theory behind this was, we'll train climate leaders and lead, lead, lead them to go do their own thing. To go out and do their own, teach their own, find their own training events, get it. And most of these uh, 2,500 or 2,900 events 
were self-created by the people. They weren't created by the Climate Reality Project. Mm -hmm. We've got a pretty big team working with our Climate Reality, it, that are assigned to work with Climate Reality leaders, but they've been mostly occupied with just doing new trainings, because we're doing four trainings a year, and the trainings are getting very, very large. You know, the, the Miami training was a thousand people from 86 countries. We're doing four a year. We're doing it all over the world. <laughs> and that's very, very time consuming. But we're about to set up a, a whole group that deals only with existing climate reality leaders mm -hmm. and try to develop programs that we can get everybody involved with and sort of also try and figure out the structure. You know, should we have, we don't have formal chapters now, should we have chapters? That's the kind of thing we're really beginning to think about now as a way to get people more involved and keep them more involved and sort of help direct what they're doing on this and come up with better ask the question of, you know, what do we ask people to do and all that, which is actually a very, very hard question on all these. So we are beginning to spend time working on how we work with everybody here. As I said, we've, Excuse me. you have questions? Just real quick while we're on the slide. It looks like we're about to hit um, 10,000 trained leaders, and that would be a big moment for everybody. Um, is that something that we can build upon? Yeah, well, one thing we're going to do next year, and probably in September, September, October is the 10th anniversary of our first training. So we're going to do a reunion, and we're going to hold we're going to hold events all around the world. We're just beginning to plan it out. Um, we've got very one exciting thing that may be involved that which I can't tell anyone, so everybody's going to be just have to wait and see. But something to think about. Um, and uh, you know, it, and I think it should be a very very interesting event, and we will make a very very big deal. We'll 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 exceed 10,000 probably in our next training. So our next training is in the Philippines, followed by China, and then two more in the US next year. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll be over that. But in, next year is when we'll do that celebration of reaching the 10,000 level. Think, and some of us in the room were excited when we hit 1,000, so mm -hmm. that'll, be, that'll be a big month. Mm -hmm. Gore is always complaining we don't have enough climate leaders, we need more. Mm -hmm. We agree, you know, we've got to get them to go to more events. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're working on that, and uh, you know, it's a great core. I mean, we really have, we think, in the climate leaders, um, are really a core of, you know, of well-trained people can really work at the grassroots, but also at the grass top level. We're working with, with organizations, with people, <coughs> speaking to people, getting them involved, getting them motivated, and we think that gives us a powerful force in the work we're doing. Okay, on that slide as well, what do you do with requests that come into headquarters for talks? Well, we have, that we do have people who, who do call around, and the people who, like, I don't know if you know Elena, some of our people that really know our climate leaders really remarkably well. We've got actually now, we've got very, very good information on everybody, and we are going more and more trying to do this peer-to-peer -peer training, trying to get business people to speak to business people, farmers to farmers. We started a program this year called the Climate Speakers Network, in which we're gonna train people in specific peer groups to speak to their peers. So for example, this year we've held nine trainings with the African American community to train African Americans speak to each other. We've held six trainings in the Hispanic community. We've held a series of trainings in the, <coughs> the faith-based community. We're gonna be holding trainings in the uh, business community, hopefully the farming community, even the conservation community, where there are a large number of people in the conservation community who fit in the 70%, but not the 1% of people who are activists. And, you know, and we want people there to be activists on these on these issues. Um, so we'll do trainings uh, in those communities also. You know, I don't think, I mean, I think I'm a pretty good speaker. I don't think if I went to a farm group in Iowa, I would have an impact. I want an Iowa farmer to speak to another Iowa farmer. And I think we'll do better. You should all think about who your peer groups are, who you can speak to effectively. I'm not saying you shouldn't speak to, I mean, there are many community groups that <coughs> we can all speak to, but to the extent you can do these specialized groups, I think it's very, very helpful uh, in the work uh, in the work that you're doing. Um, There's a question. Back sure. Um, if we have a lot of experience in many, many, many times that we've spoken to groups about a more narrow areas, for example, I've been speaking to two school boards a month about oil train um, transport through the capital quarter of, of California. Do you want those those sorts of presentations also to be posted, or just the ones? Well, so far we've only posted uh, uh, Gore's presentations. Uh -huh. We're certainly going to start posting my presentations. 
And we'll, we'll consider other people because too. I mean, it's something we're thinking I'm about speaking now. speaking publicly two or three times yes. a month. In it's a about logging Sean, I mean, a lot of the presentations that we had today. No, I have not been logging them. Are you asking yeah. whether you should log them? Or yes. Should she's yeah. asking whether she should log them as acts yeah. of leadership yeah. or as I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think she's asking whether she should log, log them as acts of leadership. Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, well, that's. No, they're actually act of leadership. You can add another 50 there then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, active leadership is a, you know, active leadership is a very broad concept. Oh, okay. we, have, we have different things, and I'll show you in a minute. We've got a new portal coming up on this. Okay, that, that's okay. helpful. Just Thank you. Them. I haven't posted yeah. them. I didn't think that you wanted them. Right. Thank you. Uh, our primary target countries where we have our branch offices are Canada. Uh, we actually don't have a branch office in the U.S., but Brazil, South Africa, Australia, India, China, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have offices in, uh, in Mexico. Um, we've got three offices in Europe, uh, really two major ones, one each in Eastern and Western Europe. Um, and we have an office in Indonesia, although it's not very active now. Our person who ran the office is actually very high in the government now, so we've got to figure out what to do about, about the office uh, going forward. Um, and this year was the first time, previously these had all been volunteer operations, this is the first year we're, we're paying staff, and, we want to, and we're going to keep on expanding that as we go forward. Um, on the social media side, um, <coughs> these are the numbers. We have about 372,000 Facebook like, likes. We reach about 3 million people through Twitter. Our email membership at Courses page reaches 2 million, and our Google page reaches 800,000 plus followers. We're hoping to really expand this with a petition campaign. That's one goal of the petition campaign. It should particularly expand the email membership and courses pages. And you know, simple things like the, uh, we did on October 2nd, uh, on last Friday, a day of action on college campuses around the country. We called it No Tomorrow. We had 60 college campuses involved. I was at the UCLA. You went to UCLA? I took Bobby Kennedy's Bobby Kennedy audience. Kennedy Jr. was After there. After he left and spoke, I took his audience and did a presentation. <laughs> Nice. Wow. <laughs> 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 that was the impact Bobby made. Yeah. <laughs> I videoed it. Did he do a good job? <coughs> <laughs> yeah. So we did it. We actually hired <laughs> ten full-time <laughs> organizers for a nineteen-week for a fourteen-week period. They, they they all have about eight or nine weeks to go. <coughs> um, they um, they worked on nineteen campuses. The other the other forty campuses were self-organized. But, like UCLA, but a lot of them had terrific things. We had Senator Markey in Massachusetts, we had Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, we had Governor Cuomo in New York, we had uh, Bobby Kennedy in uh, UCLA, we had Gore in, in Stanford. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we got, we, we have now from this, we've reached about 32,000 college students since we started. We got 25,000 petition signatures. So we have a, another great group of people to work with. You know, in colleges for a year or two, and then afterwards as they as they graduate from college. Um, so we hope to really expand this very very substantially. We we also developed this new hub. We call it the Reality Hub on our website for climate reality leaders. There'll be an outward facing page for the public, and then you'll be able to log in and go in. And there you'll be able to interact with each other, set up discussion groups, get messages, uh, hear about events, log all your stuff. Um, I spoke to one or two people today, they say it's kind of complicated, so what I think we'll do out of this is, is, is try and come up with a bunch of webinars for people trying to explain the hub and how well it works. Um, and we have people who do a very, very good job of that, but we think it's going to be a, a major help in, for everybody on climate reality leaders. And at, you know, as you use it, we'd love to hear back and see what the issues are and what the problems are. We're just sort of coming out of the, the beta stage, and we're just getting to, to the final version of it. Uh, but we are working away on it. And can we share decks? Like, if we, on, is it take PowerPoint presentations on the hub, and is there a place where we can share content? Like yes, they posted there for us. Yeah, all, 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 all the board the board presentations were on there. It's helpful to share how people adapt them yeah. for local slides, things like that. Right. Yes, yeah. yeah, Sue, so there, there is a section that, like, it, each of us can have our own file cabinet, and yeah. I have uploaded, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to share it with you. Yeah, you can have uh, yeah. Something still has to be worked on. I just add on to Ken by saying, like everybody here in this room, 
the, the train should have received an invite to this portal. So who has not logged in yet? Has anybody not logged in yet? Okay, if you've not logged in yet, maybe send me an email afterwards and we'll try to, you should look for an email from Mario Molina from about 10 days ago inviting you into the portal. If you can't find that, then we can do a follow-up. But everybody should be in now. Mario was here to speak in April and he said, you know, the people who attended in April would get an invite, but they would wait until we passed the beta stage. Yeah, every, every, everybody, everybody will get an invite. The general the public, every public will get for all of us. Um, and you know, we, we hope it'll work out very, very well and, and, and really make people's stuff easier. Um, That's how we met, was on Facebook during the presentation. <laughs> it's like I knew these names already from Facebook. That's great. Great. Um, so that's sort of where we are right now as an organization. On the program side, by the way, on the uh, on the science side, one, one slide that I like a lot, I don't, I don't know if you left, that, that we use a lot, and Gore does a different slide, it's more, more recent, but this slide shows, there was a study done from January 19-1 to November, I don't know what's wrong, to November 2012. Um, it reviewed 13,950 peer-reviewed scientific papers. I mean, an incredible number of papers. Um, out of that, 99.8% of the papers said that climate change was real and caused by human beings. That's, that's, a, that's about as strong a scientific consensus you get on everything. Um, and, you know, it, it just really is an overwhelming number. It's actually even better. I mean, 97% of scientists, they say, believe in climate change. 99.8% of the published papers that are peer reviewed are papers that say that climate change is real. And there's a later study, a one year study that, uh, that Gore uses, it's in a slide deck. There's only one paper out of a couple of thousand that said climate change is not real and caused by humans on the peer review level. These are the slides you saw before. Oops. Oops, sorry. These are the slides you saw a minute ago. We do, we do spend a lot of time, I won't do it now, talking about solutions. Because we do think you've got to convince people that solutions are there and that, they, and that they're economic and that they will benefit people if we do this transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, we believe that, that renewable energy is getting cost competitive, that it will be cost competitive even without a carbon tax. Now, we strongly back a carbon tax for a lot of different reasons, including the fact that there's a major market failure not having a carbon tax. Having a carbon tax would speed all this up. And, and having cost competitive renewables doesn't mean existing plants will close. They have to become more and more uncompetitive as fast as possible. So a carbon tax is really very, very critical to that. But the cost of this is going down. We do, uh, two things I like that are in the slides is Deutsche Bank said on January 8, 2015, we believe the trend is clear. Grid parity without subsidies is already here. Increasing parity will occur and solar penetration penetration rates are set to ramp worldwide. You know, we've been at a stage in all this where we're sort of making linear progress in addressing climate change. We're gonna get to the point where we start making exponential progress. That's gonna happen when the economics are right and the public support are right. And that's what I said, we're getting close to when I think we'll get there. Um, the other slide about that is, Bloomberg said solar plus battery is set to begin a dramatic transformation of human civilization. That's a pretty major statement. Um, that takes place. Wind is competitive. Um, this slide shows the beginning of the end of fossil fuels, the slide that we have up there. If you look at 2010, there were 105 gigawatts of uh, fossil fuel plants built and 93 gigawatts of, renew of, of clean energy renewable plants, almost equal. By this year, it's gonna be 110 gigawatts of fossil fuel versus 164 gigawatts of renewable energy, 50% more. By 2025, they say in the study it's gonna be 62 versus 242, four times much renewable energy. I think by 2025, we have a chance of getting that 62 down to almost zero. So we are making uh, tremendous progress in this area. We do need a lot of investment, I said, and I, I won't speak about this much today. It's something that I've done a lot of work on and will probably be doing work on as an organization. But just to show how big the problem is, in 2014, 270 billion was invested worldwide in clean energy. That increased clean energy share of generation by only 0.6%. Mm -hmm. wow. 
that's not nearly enough. We've got to get closer to a trillion dollars a year. The studies basically show 500 billion by 2020 and a trillion by 2030. We get two degrees, and we want to get less the faster we can do it the better. Could you put a trillion dollars in perspective? What does what is the world's budget for everything it does? I think the infrastructure budget this year uh, was about four trillion dollars, and by 2020 it's going to be nine trillion dollars or 25. So the money's out there to do the investment. Uh, the GDP of the United States is 18 trillion. Um, so there's money out there. there. There is investment money out there to do this. I, I mean, I give a whole talk about what it takes to get into renewable energy, and I do. I just published a blog on our website about that. If anybody's interested, you can take a look at it. It doesn't seem like that much compared to what we're spending on wars. And yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot when you think about the number of projects it takes to do this. You know, you need things to do. You need the projects to do it. Um, you know, a, a good sized solar farm is going to cost a billion dollars. You still need a thousand of those every year. That's a lot of money when you think about it. I really wanted to ask Al Gore this question, and I'm concerned about the resources and the mining and all of like how how many how much mineral do we have to create all of this solar and all of these batteries? And there are a lot of wars and conflicts happening mm -hmm. in the places where we're mining all of these materials. That like, seems like to be a whole other issue that hasn't quite. I don't think there's not very very much mining involved in this. I mean, it's very very minor compared to fossil fuels. There are these. Rare, rare earth minerals that go into it, they're called. Mm -hmm. But there's not, it, it's not a lot of it. The problem is there's very little of it around. Mm -hmm. Not that there's a lot to be taken out of the ground. So I don't think this is a major intrusion. Look, any, any energy project has some, some environmental effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, solar has effects if you put it in the desert. Wind obviously has effects. Um, it's a question really <laughs> of what's the best way to do it. And we think this is by far the best way to do that. There are regulatory barriers we're working on to eliminate one of our programs. We'll have programs on this. You know, things that make it difficult to put solar in. Again, I won't go through that because it's time consuming. But our goal is to make, uh, we're going to be able to say, we think in a couple of years, that renewable energy is cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable than fossil fuel energy. The transitioning to a clean energy economy will benefit the economy, create jobs, and make the country more competitive, and we remove the barriers. So when we can do that, we're going to win this fight. And again, a tax will help. A tax is needed to make the transition, but it's all part of this effort. You know, you're either going to be cheaper because of the tax, because you lower costs. Ideally, you're cheaper because of both. And the cheap, the more you are cheaper, the greater it is that these plants will close down. And that's what we're really shooting for. Um, on our program, just a couple things very quickly. One program we talk about is changing the politics of climate change. It's what I said before. How do we create the activists we need to win on this? So what does that mean for us going into 2016? We have an election year coming up. I don't have all the answers yet, but we need to figure out what our program is gonna be in relationship to the election. Maybe it's pledges on climate voters, maybe it's voter registration. You'll be hearing about that very shortly. We have a big meeting about that in a week or two. We're gonna come up with a new set of programs designed to, you know, that we can really work with everybody who are our climate leaders on that. You know, everybody, a lot of groups will be working on it. We'll try and do something that's Specific that people from that people who be trained <coughs> can become involved in, <coughs> you know, in a uh, uh, in a reasonable way. We we will we will have all this peer to peer speaking. I'm talking about um, climate speakers that which I mentioned. We also have peer to peer programs. We have a big program called I Am Pro. <coughs> um, we work with people in the ski community. We have Olympic Olympic skiers. We have resort owners, we have people who just ski, um, and it's a pretty major effort with a lot of people involved. We're gonna start expanding those peer-to-peer -peer programs. Um, obviously, for me, I have pro-birds that we do, we're gonna do training <laughs> on birds, conservation and climate change. But there are a lot of people in the birding community, the, uh, um, the main bird group based out of, out of England has 11 million members around the world. Uh, 11 million, they have 11 million people on their mailing list. That's a good number of people that we can work with. Right. Yeah. Um, so we'll. So that's another group we'll look at, and we we're looking to expand beyond that. And you know, people can think of that if they have ideas on ways we can do that. Um, I think to be politically effective, we have to do two things. We have to do on the ground organizing. We have to do social media. 
we're going to do a lot on social media. We'll come up with new stuff in the next year. But I think the social media will be most effective. Again, it works best for politicians, though, this fall. When we have ads on social media, we also have to, also have to be on the ground people and go to these politicians and say, and say that social media lets us expand and reach people we can't reach through the underground effort. We don't actually have to identify everyone, but if they know that the combination of those two, <coughs> we think we have greater political power. There are a number of uh, states, California being one of them, where in the primaries uh, you can cross <coughs> parties. And if you, I'm not sure what other states have it, but if you were able to focus on a few uh, uh, elections, primaries, not elections, where the Republicans are involved <coughs> and cause a Republican to lose a primary because of his opposition to climate change, that will have more impact on that party in the country than trying to make that same issue in an election. Yeah, you know, we've got two issues. One, of course, we, we can't do that. You know, we're a C3. We can't work on an election. So we can't, other groups will do that, but we will target a lot of our political work by district. Uh, you know, just building public support and all that. We're going to do that in districts. So we can actually do work in those districts. We just can't, you know, we have to, in a, like, for example, you have to register every voter you can if you do this. But you do it, register voters because they care about climate change and see where they fall. All right. Yeah, no, I'll go back. Okay. All right. Have you, are you working on anything about resilience, like building resilience within communities, the storms that we have, and then we want people not just rebuild the same way. Right. It's a good question. We have not worked on resilience in the past, but we are beginning to look at it very carefully. You know, uh, Al Gore's original theory was that you can't worry about resilience and adaptation until you have enough, until you're making enough progress on mitigation, because mm -hmm. you won't be able to deal with, with uh, and adaptation and, mm -hmm. and uh, resilience are not going to work if you, if you can't control climate change to some degree. We think we're making enough progress now that we can start thinking about that also. Of course, no matter how successful we are, even if we keep things at two degrees centigrade, there's still going to be huge amounts of damage from climate change. So we are going to have to start paying attention. We're going to have to start thinking about the people who are being adversely affected by that and figuring out what to do. I can't say we have the programs yet, but we are beginning to think about it. You know, to, to build on that, I, I actually did a <coughs> PhD dissertation on communities destroyed by extreme weather. And I think that one of the things that's really important to think about is that change doesn't happen. You know, it, it happens in some places and other places it doesn't happen. But those communities <coughs> that have been destroyed are like the harbingers. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have been destroyed go through very um, complete um, processes with regards to thinking about how to rebuild and where their investments are going to go. And there's a difference between people who rebuild to the footprint of the past and people who are really willing to sit in uncertainty and create something new. So I, I think it's a really important area to um, invest in. Um, yeah, it is. It's an important and difficult and, and we, in our Miami training, of course, we had a session, set, you had a session or two on this. Um, you know, Miami Beach is sort of, both an example of what's being done, an example of why it's so difficult for everybody to do it. They have flooding now in high tides without any rain or anything like that, including when we were there. They had pretty major flooding. I mean, streets were closed and everything with on perfectly sunny days with no rain at all. So they are taking steps to do that. They're a leader in that, but they're spending $500 million now to protect essentially a couple of miles of beachfront. There are not many communities that can do that. It's great. People, the locals are posting pictures of them like knee deep trying to walk across the street. You know, they can't wear shoes. Yeah, the amazing thing though, to tell, you know, show how difficult the politics is, of course, the Republican governor, Republicans all deny there's any climate change. So, <laughs> you know, so have this image of the governor walking through the blood <laughs> thing. I don't see anything. You know. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's years. exactly it, because what you're asking people to do is imagine the future yeah. based on what it is that they're seeing around them. And right. they can argue <clears throat> up the wazoo, but if people rebuild, they're not going to rebuild in the old way. Well, they're they do going a lot. That's one of the problems. Hmm? They do a lot still, and we've got to figure out what to do about that. Well, I, I didn't find that. I actually Good. found that some people, they're, they all make, they may only choose energy um, star appliances, 
but their footprint, if you were to measure actually the footprint before and after, even with a relatively conservative community, you will see a dramatic change in the footprint, ener energy footprint. No, I agree with that. That's, that's absolutely true. It's hard to get people to move out of these, you know, out of these flood zones and stuff. That's the biggest problem we have, have particularly with insurance. Well, what about the insurance industry, though? I mean, how many storms can they handle? <coughs> well, the insurance industry is split. The insurance industry in Europe is very pro deal with climate change. The American insurance industry talks about it all the time, but they're not as active politically. Is there a link on the webs website to the political work and the work you're doing with campaigns? I ask because I'm campaigning in Reno, and are you actually identifying locations where there's some high stakes energy Well, not yet, but we, we will be doing that. Again, we can't throw the context of making I, campaigns. I understand, I understand yes. that. We'll, 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 we'll be identifying districts that are Is there a link or a way that I can- Not yet. With that? How would I be able to know when that's there? I, you just, I think, well, right now you just gotta check our website. And okay. then, uh, thank you. It should be also on the hub when we do something like that. Okay, thank you. Do you have any plans or any theories for like putting more out there on television? Like, you know, is that too? Yeah, if we can ramp it up money. money. <laughs> oh, is that it? That's the barrier. TV is, I mean, TV is very, very expensive, but we don't actually think we need to use TV. I mean, social media has tremendous potential, but one thing I've learned as a lawyer about social media, because I didn't really know much about it when I thought it is, the more money you spend, the better you do. I mean, you, know, you can reach people. You can, you can go on Facebook, people don't realize it. You can spend ten million dollars on flesh making on Facebook on Facebook advertising what you're doing, and obviously we don't have that kind of money. So we're trying to raise as much money as we can for the communications work we're doing. We work with very sophisticated advertising agencies to try and figure out the best way to do it to get as much free advertising as we can to reach as, as, as wide an audience as we can. We may have some. We're hoping to get some TV coverage in 24 hours, but we're not sure that we will. Go to the, my site and click like, share, and this and that. I noticed they didn't do that in Iowa or Miami. You would have had like a couple thousand like clicks and shares. Well, I'm, the, I'm the one who's gonna have to do it, but I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, so, so I am from Andre, and um, I think the challenge that I've had is, and you even mentioned it about the feeling of belonging. So a lot of times, you know, I feel like I'm a little bit of uh, a little tiny island out there. Power comes from a group like this, and it's really fortunate that you guys have to. It's unfortunate that I have to drive my car all the way up here to have a meeting like this. And I was hoping that you know maybe as the evolution of, of the climate and allergy project goes, it, it, it does a better job of connecting connecting us with us. You know. Okay, again, we're trying to do that, but you know, you raised a very interesting point. The most disturbing poll that we did, we've done some internal some polling on our own, <coughs> is a poll that showed the following. It showed that. Most people in America understand climate change, I mean, to a degree that was greater than we expected. They think, however, that they can't do anything, the government won't do anything, they don't think they can do anything collectively. So they're doing stuff on their own, which is okay, except that the last finding is they're all satisfied with what they do. And, you know, that's the problem with that's, 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 that's the problem with overemphasizing individual behavior. Exactly, that's, 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 that's the fundamental that's problem with overemphasizing. Over 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 it's but not going to stop. Yeah, you know, turning the lights on. There's, there's, there's huge opportunity costs and consequences to having the emergent overemphasis on individual. Behavior. No question. That's why we we emphasize government action more. Although we're trying to do individual action programs, we, we would, for example, have a very active, very active program encouraging <coughs> solar demand creation, except for the fact that uh, Gore has investments in, in Solar City, and therefore uh, yeah. we can't do anything. It looks like it's we don't want to do anything that looks like he's benefiting from it, so mm -hmm. we got to be very careful about that. So my question is about coordinating with other groups. For example, and it kind of goes to this belonging thing. As an activist, you know, I'm also getting uh, information from 350. Mm -hmm. We have 350 Bay Area, and you know, you'll get that. I'll get an announcement. There's this event. Come to this event, and or what are we? You know, they've got something planned <coughs> for. Paris, and you've got something planned for going to Paris, and it's kind of from the point of view of people that are interested in the issue, and then there's all the other environmental groups that send me their emails. I have that well. same problem. So yeah. it's kind of really weird on this end to like, like you're not, you know, like you're just driving.
trying to like, you're the only player of all of these these things that are going on. Meanwhile, there's 350 organizing on campuses too. And mm -hmm. so my, I, don't, my, I don't know exactly what the question is. The question is how do you coordinate or how do you, oh, um, what's your answer? It's, it's, no, it's, 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 it's a very good question. I don't mean, I, obviously I don't mean to imply we're the only group. We're trying, we are doing, much, we're doing as much as we can out of working coalitions with groups. We're going to have most environment, very large number of environmental groups, for example, are partners in 24 hours of reality, okay. in return for which we said we partner with them on the work they're doing. Okay. You know, we partnered, for example, in the, in the, the in the March, for yeah. example, yeah. which we weren't the leaders in. We're, we're going to do that. Look, the environmental community can be its own worst enemy yeah. by, by being, you know, by being very, yeah. you know, yeah. very different. Yeah. And, and it's really, really bad. I mean, something like the climate march, they had no speakers. One reason they didn't have any speakers was nobody could agree on what the theme should be. And you know, and you really need on a, you really need on an event like that to have power a couple of people speaking for everybody. San Diego had theirs like at one o'clock in the morning. Like <laughs> it just didn't yeah. make any sense. So I mean, we we're going to try very very hard on that. It's not easy. It's I mean, not easy because when we do this stuff, and, and we're always trying to figure out what role can we play that other people aren't doing. And one role is we have all of you guys who are really well trained in a way that no other group really has. So actually it might be something I address back to us as a group to be aware, to share other activities that are happening. Well, we, I, look, I, we, we, can't, we can't accomplish any of this on our own. Yeah. We gotta work together with everybody. I, I, Let me I, just go to the back first and I'll come back to that. Do you foresee uh, any point in which there might be a, a transition to a more democratic structure for the project? Yeah. Of course, it, it's an outgrowth mm -hmm. of you know, a projection of, a, of an inspiring leader, but uh, do, do you think the movement might be strengthened by a more uh, bottom-up uh, uh, involvement in decision-making process, et cetera, at some point? I'm not sure I completely understand your question. What do you have in mind? Well, I mean, Just say no. nothing uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> really elaborate, but uh, it, you know, I, it seems to me that times uh, the uh, identification with uh, uh, Al Gore, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, it may be too involved, too identified uh, with, uh, you know, a single leader's uh, great contribution. Well, you know, look, my view on this is really pretty straightforward. I mean, when we, when we formed the organization in 2007, our first TV ads were Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich mm -hmm. supporting the climate change bill. We haven't changed, mm -hmm. and Gore hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. You know, they've moved away, and they have made it the symbol of their attack on everything. The fact of the matter is that Gore's position is very reasonable. He's an extremely experienced, good businessman. He probably understands business and how to work with business as well or better than almost any other politician out there. And outside the United States, we have none of these issues. Outside the United States, he's a hero everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we deal with that in the United States? For example, do we not, we were talking about today, work on the uh, on the tax stuff, uh, the ground that will make it too political, um, when citizens find the lobby. Uh, we'll see on that, but we're trying, we tried this year for the first time, had a leading Republican uh, who ran one of the, the, probably the largest climate Republican organization who wanted to join climate reality. He wanted to lead and, so, and leave and start doing work for us. We said, okay, if we get it, if we could put together an advisory committee of Republicans, and we couldn't do it. We couldn't get enough support as yet. I think that's going to change as time goes on, and that's what we're working on to try and change that, and to get and to try and get that support. If in fact we get Republicans <coughs> working with Gore, that would be extremely powerful for the reasons you're saying. And so that's really our goal in this. We'll be careful about campaigns, and we won't do anything that, you know, uh, mess up a campaign because we make it makes him too easy a target domestically on that. But we don't have that problem outside the United States. And you know, we're, we're trying to balance that out the best we can. I mean, it is his organization, and there's no way to get around that. But we'll still be as sophisticated as we can in doing that. Good answer. Yeah, when the tide shifts, those politicians are going to come running to you and try to jump to the head of the group. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm interested in the You what? Um, can I turn my back to you so I can address okay. I won't be <laughs> so, um, so what we do in Sweden is we also have the same problem that you have all these events 
because the invitation's coming and they're gonna be listening by the talking to each other, right? So I run an organization called A Win-Win World. So we took an initiative to invite all the other climate organizations. And so we did this in September and to discuss what to do, what kind of activities to do beyond Paris. Uh, so we have this group now that we actually connect and we discuss and how can we help and we share the events. What we also do in our city in Gothenburg is that we are a group of individuals that we meet for lunch once every month. And then we share, okay, so there's one from 350.org, there's one from the fossil fuel, uh, free fossil fuel movement, there's one from the university, there's another one that works for the city of Gothenburg. And we just eat lunch and we say, what is up for the next month in your organization? And we share this and we have an agreement that we, sh we share each other's events in our uh, social media and in our groups. So that's basically something you can do here too, or in, in your um, groups or in your communities. Thank you. Hi, Good. Okay. okay. Um, 350.org is um, working on coming up with an alliance for the Green Group. And they haven't finalized anything yet. We met meeting in, on the peninsula earlier this week. <coughs> they um, are, are thinking of calling it um, the Green Umbrella Alliance. So. Okay, good to hear. Thank you. And maybe just do a, a couple more and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up and you, you can keep taking people afterwards, but we'll try to adjourn in that. Yeah. 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 Quick segue. And what I think we're starting to hear is what I've been thinking was missing with Climate Reality so far is a local organization. This is delightful to me. This is the first time I've actually been with people since Chicago, right? Except for on the phone. Um, but what we also need to do, I think, is recognize that local politicians come from local organizations. And that's what we haven't really worked through uh, to this organization. And I think, at least where I'm from, a small community just south of Silicon Valley, Okay, from San Juan Batista, which is a little nothing place, but it's the only um, place in California where we banned fracking last year, so mm -hmm. we became important because we took our supervisors, who were all Republicans, and got them to vote for this because it was a local pressure. And I think that local organizations need to be players and that we need to play with those local organizations, especially if we're not in an urban area. And that will help, I think, also, if we can have in the hub something where we can feed in what we're doing locally, it might help that way. Okay. At least on the Facebook page, you could do that for Northern California, I would say. That's Why don't we take one more question? Thank you. This is great. Um, the one piece of the puzzle that is missing, in my experience and firm belief and passion, and I didn't hear tonight, and I never hear it anywhere, and so I'm wondering why I'm missing something or everybody else. That's right. What, fracking? No, 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 much bigger picture. My, my background is mainstream news reporting, CBS radio, 28 years. Last 18 years covering the Green Beat, from Trash Talk Minutes locally to the Eco Talk show on Air America to the Green Front on the internet. I'm now petitioning CNN to get the Green Talk show on, for MSNBC to take their prison lockup documentaries, oh. which are doing what for the world, and have <laughs> Green Talk programming from Friday afternoon to Sunday. And I'm wondering if anyone else sees that the fact that they've got Fox News and all this programming and channels that are trying to distort reality and slow down progress might have something to do with the fact that we have been losing and if we're gonna have, if we have this tiny window climactically and if this is the biggest, is biggest issue of our time, I keep asking how come there's no <coughs> dedicated program? We're not talking about PSA, paid advertisements. There's so many things to talk about. There's so little time, there's so much interconnectedness if anyone is interested in working with me, I would be happy to share my card where there are 5,000 radio shows on climate change and everything else under the sun we, here. I just, I'm asking because I really am serious about this being our moment. And I'm working on, if they don't say yes, CNN or MSNBC starting the Green News Network. If anyone would like to work on that. Tell us your name and where you're from. Rosenberg. Okay. And I'm from we, we, did, we, did in, we did in Miami have a panel on news media Chris and Hayes, climate change. Yeah. And we had Chris Hayes, and we had uh, uh, Colbert, Elizabeth Colbert, and we had a really great panel on it. Mm -hmm. If you want, I would go on our website if you haven't seen it. I've seen it all, and I'll tell you. The yeah, I'll and they, they sort of laid out the reasons why it's so difficult. You know, there's a good argument that Fox is not a news channel. Fox is just a paid advertising channel. It's ridiculous. You know, to put it mildly, but uh, uh, 
uh, look, we, we want to do we want to do as much of this as we can on the advertising side and all the rest of that, but it's very, very expensive. I mean, that's the disadvantage we have as the environmental community on this. Now, on social media, though, there's a lot of outreach. There are lots of programs now that talk about <laughs> climate change. I'm being interviewed next week for 30 minutes on some, I never even heard of it, I don't remember the name, some national syndicated program that's on, that goes on the internet on climate change. The what internet is great, social media is great. I'm trying to reach all the baby boomers who still get a lot of their information from mainstream network no, radio and yeah. television. But and I think overlooking that is a big mistake. And I think that Chris Hayes, who I am in touch with, um, saying that it's hard to make this interesting. No, it's not. Go listen to the shows and the people that I've had on. And there are so many passionate, positive people behind the scenes. And that's why I've decided, forget radio, we need to show the possibilities here. It's not hard to make it interesting if you have people who believe how urgent this is. And so I, I heard the conversation and... Yeah, the, the argument of Chris Hayes and those guys, and I'm not defending what they're saying is, first of all, he comes with the thing, you know. But his argument is the problem we have is that, you know, the news, real news basically covers events. They cover things that happen. That's where most of their coverage is. And, you know, aside from disasters, you know, it, it's harder to find stories to tell them out there. Uh, that's sort of his defense. I'm not saying that's South a valid Carolina, defense, but, but that's the argument you got to deal with. They're not connecting the dots between this one and a thousand year storm. Media. That's the problem. It is. <laughs> anyway, thank you. All right, Ken, thank you for being our guest. Thank you. Thank you.